Good evening, everyone. So good to have you all join us this evening. Our call to worship this, this evening comes from Psalm 100. This short and well-known psalm begins with a summons that goes beyond the narrow confines of the nation of Israel to the islands of the world, to the whole world, and to all the nations. The thing that unites us all in the, is the knowledge that the Lord, Yahweh, is the creator of us all, both Jew and Gentile. On, on this basis, we are called to worship him with joyful shouts, with singing, with thanksgiving and praise. And the psalm ends with a proclamation of the Lord's mercy and truth. It's not hard to see a picture of his glorious everlasting gospel in those last uh, couple of verses. This psalm has been described as a joyful song for a happy God and is preserved in a lovely hymn in the Scottish Psalter, which I will read after I have read the psalm itself. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it as much as I have. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that he is God. He is the Lord, that he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. For we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. And Psalm 100 from the 1650 Scottish Psalter paraphrases it like this, and I just love this. All people on the earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. Know that the Lord is God indeed. Without our aid he did us make. We are his flock, he doth us feed, and for his sheep he doth us take. O oh, enter then his gates with praise, approach with joy his courts unto. Praise, Lord, and bless his holy name, always, for it is seemly so to do. For why? The Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever sure. All truth, his truth, at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. Amen. Father, we thank you that you are our maker, our preserver, our sustainer. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that your mercy and truth are from age to age. They will always prevail. We thank you, Lord, for the everlasting gospel of your Son. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you and rejoice with singing, with gladness, with praise, for you are good to us now and always. We are your people, and we are thankful to you that you are our God. Amen. Well, church, it's now my, my pleasure to bring us the Word of God and my absolute privilege to preach to us as we finish off this week. Tragically, we're, we're finishing the, the church series. It's been an amazing journey. I've loved studying this. I've loved sharing this, and I've especially loved just hearing feedback and receiving questions and messages and emails about how people's minds are just being changed and how they've related to the church and how they think of the church and having their, their views of a local church go from a, a small gathering of people who worship and there's a teacher to, to the, the infinitely valuable, significant, powerful worship of God going on, the, the tool that he has and vessel in his mission on the earth uh, how we should be relating to it. I've, I hope that you have been immensely blessed as much as I have and all these other people who are uh, growing in so many ways. So I want to encourage 
please go back and listen to the church. Maybe you're new to Hope Church. Uh, The best thing that you can do to get to know Hope Church until we can start meeting up again and you can get to meet everybody here, uh, the best thing you can do is go back and listen to what our theology of the church and what our plan for this church is from Scripture that we've been preaching on. Uh, or if you're, if you're a regular, this is your home, uh, but you have missed many of the sermons, please make sure that you uh, devour all of those because that really is the, is the practical theology of what we've been going through. It's the practical theology of how we do life in the church. So please do that. And tonight we, we finish it off with a message on the, on the quality of, qualities or the culture of what to expect or, or aim at or what a healthy church will, will have in, in the atmosphere, in the, the culture of a church. Uh, we've looked at God planting the church, building the church through his truth, through his word, how he used the apostles and, and we even looked at the spiritual gifts in the church. We've looked at the leadership in the church, in local churches. We've looked at the significance of the worldwide and, uh, and local visible church. We've looked at what its mission is, uh, what, the, the, what we should be aiming at in terms of what, a true, what the three marks of a church are. Uh, uh, and now we, we finish with, well, well, that all being the case, of course, last week we looked at the ordinary means of grace, those usual ways that God blesses and grows us individually and as a body, which we should be making use of and which we can faithfully expect God will always bless us through those, being the Word of God, the, the ordinances, and prayer. Well, this week we're asking the question, what should be, in, in a church, what should be the, the atmosphere, the culture that is growing in a church? And uh, before we start, I just want to give us our, the reminder of our announcements, of course, that tomorrow night you can... Uh, join us on Monday evening on Zoom app. We're going to be uh, having the, the, the Knowing God Bible study where, where I break down J.I. Packer's um, uh, book, Knowing God, chapter by chapter, and look at how that should be applied to our life as he leads us through Scripture. Uh, I want to encourage you as well to be involved in some of the virtual fellowship groups that are going on. Contact us if you don't have one to be involved in. Uh, definitely be doing that as we continue to encourage each other through this uh, difficult for many times. Uh, I also want to uh, encourage you to make, be making use of the kids' resources that our wonderful Kids Church uh, Ministry um, Coordinator, Miss Grace, is uh, doing. So they're on the end of the morning sermon. But you can also access the children's video and activities and Bible readings and studies in the app. They're, they're all linked there in our Hope Church app. So please go and get that for that purpose. Our families, we want you to be engaging in family worship. We want your kids to be continuing to grow. Even though they can't come to church, you're their pastors. You're their spiritual leaders. God has given you to them primarily to grow them. So please be doing that, watching over their souls and feeding them. Uh, But download the app, which is free and on the app store. And many people have from actually across the globe, which is very exciting. But get onto it so that you can access all that teaching and additional uh, teaching resources that we're updating and uploading throughout the week. That'd be well, my encouragement to you. Uh, and now, as we begin our uh, sermon, let me take a drink and we'll jump on in. It's somewhat, it's actually somewhat uh, unhelpful to think about how we should try and grow a culture or, or have an atmosphere. I'm, I'm sure you've been... Uh, in certain churches before that have tried to manufacture a culture or atmosphere. And, and that's just the thing about atmosphere and culture is that as soon as you try to, to manufacture it, it by necessity becomes quite, uh, quite false, quite ingenuine, not real because, well, you're, you're trying too hard in order to grow this feeling. What, what we rather want to ask is not what atmosphere should we create, what culture should we try and manufacture, but rather what is, the, what is the culture that we should expect to see 
if a church is healthy, growing around God's ordinary means of grace, under his loving and biblical leadership, on the mission that he sent us to, utilizing our spiritual gifts one to another, on the mission for God. What, what should be a culture that we expect to see? I ask this almost primarily because there are many atmospheres, cultures, uh, feelings that you can uh, receive or see or feel or, or witness at other churches or many churches or many versions of, of churches that, that are actually quite attractive to us humans, but are actually unbiblical or at the very least uh, unnecessary. There's, there's all sorts of things that you can rock up into, and we've said this before, you can, you can rock up into your country club or your sports team or a music concert And those feelings that you get there as to why you love it so much, they're the same feelings that you might love a church because of. And and they're not necessarily right. What we see is that uh, these cultures, I'll I'll, uh, finish introducing this here before we jump in, is that the culture or the atmosphere that a church should be growing is an ideal. It is an ideal that we don't expect or demand straight up or to ever be some perfect and clean slate of, a, of an atmosphere. I mean, you can just take one uh, cursory reading through Scripture's New Testament and see that every single church had enormous problems. And even those healthy ones, which were maybe growing towards this kind of biblical culture, even they were struggling in so many ways because that's church life. Messy not ideal, never ideal. There is no such thing as ideals in church. Throw that aside. All those preferences that we want and desire that are ideals, get rid of them. The real life church filled with real life sinners being really developed and transformed by God's amazing grace is a lot less pretty than what you would want to first see. But this is what the 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 uh, the, the Old Testament church, what we would call the, the building, the temple, and the gathered saints and the holy assemblies, the way that God had so designed Israel through their worship and their laws, it was all in order to show the whole world, all of the Gentile nations who had their own gods and their own ways of worship and their own laws, which were disgusting and violent and immoral and false worship. God so set up his nation that all of those other nations would look on and look in and say that God is just so very different. That whole nation, I may not have met their God, I may not know about their God, but I look at that nation and I see that their God is very different. Their God is holy. Their God claims to be the only God. They believe he is the only sovereign, one true living God involved with them. He cares about their righteousness. He cares about how they treat people and don't oppress people. The the people of the world learn a lot by looking at the Old Testament Israel about their God. And so it is in the New Testament that we are the new temple that we are the new Israel in some sense. And so the world around us in this pagan world looks on to the church and sees the way that we worship, particularly the way that we treat each other and live our lives. They look at that and say, this says something about their God. They may not believe in our God. They may not believe in our scriptures but they read our lives, they see our lives, they hear our words, they see how we treat each other and they say, there is something about these people. There is something to the truth that they say. There is a power in their life. There is, I'm learning about their God by looking at their lives together. And that's the aim. So I want to say three things that our church should manifest in the, in the culture, if we want to call it that, of our church in order to rightly reflect our God. They are love, incarnated mission, and grace. Love, incarnated mission, and grace. Let's start talking about love. Love is, from the very beginning of history, a Trinitarian act. The reason reason that we have 
love, the reason that God overflows in love and acts in love and manifests his love through Scripture is because God is a triune being. He, he is Father. Maybe this is the first time you've heard this. We call this the Trinity, that God is one God, only one God over all things, creator of all. But in his nature, he is three distinct persons. One being, one nature, one essence, but he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before the creation of the world, God was not needing anything. God was not lonely. He was, in the most purest sense, in a community of infinite, perfect love. That's our triune God. So that John says in his epistle, God is love. It's this eternal love that's existed forever. It's an infinite love as God is infinite. And it is the motivation of all that we see happen throughout God's planning. That is why he creates out of love. That is why he elects some people to save. That's out of his love. That is why he chooses to send his son. For he has so loved the world that he gave his son. God's love is (coughs) central (coughs) to all things. And so it should be for us. But also, not just in the Trinity, but in the gospel, of course, we see God's love. We also see that, that love is manifested to us in the gospel. Everything about the gospel is this Trinity loving us, that we read in 1 John, that how great the love of the Father that He has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Or that we're told of the Son, that that uh, in, in the book of John, we're told that, no man, that, that man knows no greater love than this, than to lay down his life for his friends, speaking of what Jesus was to do. It was all an act of love from Jesus. And in fact, the Spirit is the Spirit of love. The very first fruit of the Spirit in the list is love. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and so the list continues. That in the gospel we see the Trinity, who has loved for eternity, manifests that love. And so that should be a, a fundamental and essential part of our culture here at Hope and any church that seeks to be like God, that seeks to show the world what God is like. He's loving. We're loving. Loving is, of course, not, as we see in the Trinity and we see in the gospel, love is not a feeling. Love may be, should be, must be, will be accompanied by certain emotions, but friends, love is sacrificial service. That's what love is defined for us in Jesus, defined for us in Scripture. Love is sacrificing to serve others. That is the love that he has shown to us. That is the love that we should be showing one another. And it's most tangibly love of God to us of God to our brothers and sisters, is most tangibly experienced, and here's my application and and encouragement for you, it's most tangibly experienced in fellowship, in God's family, that he has not just adopted you as one kid and another person as another kid in a separate household, but that we are a family, that we love because the Father loves, and we've got the same Father. We love in sacrifice and service to each other at great cost because Jesus, our older brother, showed us how to do that for one another. We're brothers, we're sisters, we join in this. That should be one thing that begins growing in a church that is on mission in the right way. But then secondly, I want to say that love leads into incarnated mission. Now, (coughs) what I mean by that incarnated mission is that we are a church on mission, evangelistic, sharing the gospel, building the church, church planting, raising leaders, sending them out. That's what we're doing. We're on mission as we spoke about two weeks ago. But that that is an incarnated mission. I mean by that, uh, well, well let, me, let me explain. Jesus, in his incarnation, came out of that loving, triune, eternal, infinite, nature, he stepped into human life. He became a real, true human being. He became not a God who floated above the earth and and was free from sickness and tragedy and pain and, and the human experience, but rather 
truly God, maintained all of his divine attributes, but, but, in, but, but became joined forever into eternity. He joined himself to a human nature, became a single-celled zygote, developed in a woman's womb and was born, lived his life through pain and difficulty and struggles and learning a language and learning to read and studying scripture and being persecuted until he was a teacher thrown to the cross, died, dead, buried, raised and ascended. He did all of this as a human. He didn't stay far off speaking to us only, but came into our experience Uh, into our experience, related with us, like us, alongside us, yet without sin, in order to accomplish the mission sent to do. And I want to say that as he did that, so the Bible shows us that, that the mission we should be on, here's where I'm going, the mission that we're on is an incarnation ministry, is an incarnation mission. We don't stay far back, we don't speak Uh, from away from the world, but we engage with the world like Jesus did. The Bible even is an example of this. Not a particular verse. I mean, this book, this thing is a picture, a, a display, a manifestation of the fact that God enters into our reality in an incarnated mission. I say that because God did not drop down this, this golden book on leaf uh, from heaven in some angelic language, in some otherworldly uh, material. But rather, he spoke in human languages. What a condescension for, for God, the, the true divine being God, to come and uh, uh, so uh, uh, humble himself in order to speak in human language. In fact, even the New Testament, as we see, that as it was written, Matthew through to Revelation, it's written for us in the inspired text in Koine Greek. What I mean by that is that there was two Greeks spoken of the day. Again, it wasn't some angelic language given to us for us to work hard to decipher. God met us in our language, spoke to the human language of the day that we might understand. But it was not even just in, in the scholarly language. That was another version of the Greek. Rather, what God had his apostles write down his holy inspired book into was the common, vulgar, marketplace, layperson language. You know, it wasn't in our day, it wasn't high king's English with, or queen's English, as we say, with, with thys and thous and these and lots of elongated uh, words in, in, uh, mixed with Latin like you can read. No, no, no. No, he spoke in the language of the day to the people of the day so that it could be understood by all, accessible to all, and transformational to all. That's the gospel. And so we as a church should, while we're embodying love and sacrificial service, and that, Jesus said, is how the world knows that we're his disciples. But we, to the world, are are not standing far off, are not speaking in a a high and holier than thou language and, and keeping them at arm's length, but we enter into this world, into the life of our neighbors, into the, the life of those people from work. We're, we're offering, we're, we're giving, we're sacrificing, we're inviting over, we're having meals with, we're listening to struggles, we're praying for these people, the world, in their world, like Jesus was incarnated into the world, like God spoke the language of the people. So we enter into the world, speak their language, talk to them, minister to them. I make another point here that is, as this is a, a church seeking to be on mission in that way, there's certain elements that we will, in our gospel preaching, uh, that we will develop. And, and in this way, I mean that we are in our event, first of all, we are evangelistic. So, so that you are not glad that you're at a great reformed church over here and you like the teaching and you like these books and you recommend these books and, and this is your lovely little bubble of Christianity. Now we pop that bubble like Jesus did and come into the world. 
but that as we evangelize and share that good news with others, we also have an ear and have a mind a little bit bent towards the apologetic side of things. And I don't mean that you need a degree in apologetics and all the best arguments, but what I mean is you're always asking the question as you share the gospel, you're asking the question as you live your life, as you invite to church, as you engage in conversation about maybe even political and social uh, occurrences in the world, you're always asking the question, how can I help this person, this non-Christian, see that this really is true? Not just for me, but for everybody. How can I help them understand that God loves them in Jesus? How can I help them to understand the gospel in, in their language in a way that they would understand? This is the, what I mean by the apologetic bent to our life that we've always got a mind to how can I help the world on the outside understand what Jesus is saying. That's what Jesus does for us. That's what we do for each other. That's what we do for the world. So we, we, we have a culture of <clears throat> one that grows in love, as God is love, as the gospel shows us love. We have one that grows in an incarnated mission that we are joining, we are coming into the world preaching the gospel in the language with lives that, that are, are with, without sin, but with those in the world. And thirdly, I want to say that we have a culture of grace. And I say, I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll tell you how I landed on this word, grace. I almost wanted to say that we have a gospel culture. And, and that's quite a, a popular quite a common phrase to be using. And I'm not against it as much as I am wary of it, that we would have a gospel culture among us. You know, one that's forgiving each other and one that's, uh, you know, shaped like and looks like the gospel. And, and the reason I won't say gospel culture is because it's actually quite a confusion of terms. The gospel is not simply a theme or a cloud of, of multiple different meanings that we can sort of just tack on to a hyphen on a word and make it like that. You know, I've seen gospel car washes. I've, I've seen gospel food ministries. I've seen gospel, you've seen gospel this, gospel that, and sometimes that maintains what the word gospel really means, and other times it really just means a Christian thing. Well, we at Hope, we defend and we are careful to protect the meaning, the definition, the importance of and centrality of the gospel in all that we do, but especially in its meaning. The gospel is that the Father has sent the Son to this rebellious, sinful world of you and me and the world who are sinners and rebels against God, refusing his laws, breaking his laws, offending him, at war with God. That's us. God sent his son, the member of the Trinity, and the son willingly came to the earth in order to take our sin upon himself, die for us as a, as a way to absorb the wrath of God and the guilt of our sin, in order to pay the punishment that your sin deserved, Jesus went to the cross. He died not just at the hands of the Romans, but at the hand of God. And as God punished him, your sins were punished. As God poured his wrath out on him, your guilt was receiving what it deserved in Jesus. And so, as Jesus died, having paid that debt, he rose from the dead victorious. Now, now putting death down, Killing death, Jesus rose and ascended 40 days later, sitting at the right hand of God on the throne, still joined to that human nature. So that we, you and I, by simply believing, he has said, you receive forgiveness, you receive adoption, you receive transformation into God's family, and when you die into heaven, you receive that by, by receiving all that Jesus did for you. And you receive that by simple faith. Nothing you do. You know, given a list to achieve, a test to take, a, 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 a lifestyle quiz. No, if you, in the depth of your sin, whoever you are, wherever you are, no matter what you've done or has been done against you, no matter what you plan to do, no matter how rebellious you are, this moment, God says, repent of that sin. Consider it as deadly and as guilty and as disgusting. That's your sin. 
Consider your sin that way, your whole lifestyle, your whole person, filthy before God. But realize that in Jesus, it can all be forgiven. It can all be cleansed and you can be justified. You can come into right standing with God. If you have faith, believe that, that all becomes true. It is applied to you by God's spirit and you come into God's church, God's family, in a forgiven, justified state, ready to be on mission for Jesus and be with him forever. Now that that gospel that I've just explained and is true, It doesn't quite make sense then to say that we have a propitiation culture here at church. Or or we have a Jesus died for my sins in order for you to be in order for me to be justified before God's righteous and holy standard culture. Do you see what I mean? That if that if we keep the gospel meaning what it means, you can't just tack it onto other words. It loses its meaning. So, So we maintain and we hold. That rather, the gospel is the gospel. It's in what we say. It's in the words that we preach. It's, it's our focus and our fundamental basis for everything. But the culture that we have is not, I'm not going to use that commonly used phrase and say gospel culture. Rather, I'll use what I think many are trying to get at, that we have a gracious culture. We have a culture of love, culture of incarnated mission, and a culture of grace one to another. By this I mean that, that we have as, as even, you know, I'll, I'll turn to Ephesians chapter 1 for us. Ephesians chapter 1, where we read in uh, verses 5 through to 8, we see that um, in love, He, this is the Father, God to us, in love, as we spoke about first. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You see, the gospel is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel of not receiving what we deserve. It is a gospel not not of receiving the justice we've deserved or earned, but rather, in grace, God takes that away and gives it to Jesus and takes his love and his blessing and his forgiveness and gives it to us when we deserve none of it. That's a gospel of grace. And so as as we live in light of that, the gospel, the gospel shapes our life to be forgiving to each other as as we read, from Paul who tells us to forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. We live this out by, by forgiving each other's sins. By bearing with each other as we're going to see in a moment from uh, uh, later on in Galatians. So, so the gospel is grace from God and so it should inform our culture at church. It's, it's the gospel of, uh, sorry, grace is the, the continual attitude, the permeating atmosphere of God towards his bride, the church. We're told back in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, when God is introducing himself in a way to Moses, he defines himself as the great I am. I am who I am. That's God. That's his name coming into the the, the English in a way as Yahweh. But in describing himself, he says that I am slow to anger, abounding in steadfast, unshakable love. And this is what we've seen as as we look over the last 2,000 years of church history, as well as God's history with Israel, we see that he has been towards the church in all of the fumbling and all of her failures, her weaknesses, her corruptions, her mistakes. He has been slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Friend, I know that you can look back over your life and, and maybe your life in church, maybe even the history of this very church, and you can say, wow, God has been so faithfully loving, so slow to anger and steadfast in his love because we have done so many things deserving of his judgment. 
So many things that don't deserve his love, that have deserved the opposite of his love and blessing, and yet he has blessed us, protected us, made us to flourish and grow. And, and of course, that's because God is gracious. Now, how does this come into our culture? Coming into the culture of a church should be this grace-informed lifestyle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at uh, Galatians chapter 6 for a moment here and see how um, we have, in fact, been told to show this grace towards one another. So let me read from verse 1. I'm going to show that, that, that a gracious culture shows itself Primarily, I think, in a restorative culture or, or, or a culture of people, brothers and sisters, restoring each other, not giving us what we deserved, but raising one another up despite what we deserve, as God does towards us. So Galatians 6 verse 1 tells us, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you've been there, You've seen brothers and sisters be there, caught in addiction, caught in, in struggling with a sin, caught in a situation that is dragging them down. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. When, when Adam had Cain and Abel, and God speaking to Cain and, and Adam asking of Cain about his brother Abel, Cain, Cain yells out with, with an anger, what am, am I my brother's keeper? Do I keep watch over my brother? Is that what you expect of me? I don't know where he is. Get off my back. And to that, he took a few thousand years to say it. But to that, the answer comes through Paul and says, brothers, keep an eye on each other. Look after each other. Restore each other. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are the very thing God has put in his life to help him when he's caught, to help him when he's weak, to help him when he needs somebody. If we believe in God's grace and we have really been gripped by it, changed by it, then we are freed up and we are empowered to show grace that restores, that forgives, that helps one another. He goes on. Bear, oh, he's, well, he says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Always a warning. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We, we bear each other's burdens. That is, somebody who's overloaded with, with stresses in life, with responsibilities on their back, or with sin and trials and temptations, that we realize that spiritual strength and spiritual maturity is not for position, is not for a title, is not for pomp and pride. If God has given you, friend, and I talk to the mature among us, I talk to the Christians who've been walking with Jesus, faithfully for a while. You, you have some sin in your life that you're still dealing with, but by and large, you've, you're walking righteously with Christ. He blesses your way. He, uh, he, he uses you to bring others to faith or to grow others in their faith. He answers your prayers. He helps you. You're walking with Jesus. You're a mature spiritual person, as Galatians 6 means it. And God has given you that strength, that doctrinal knowledge, that experience, God has given it to you so that you can use it to serve your weaker, maybe more annoying, maybe more foolish, maybe, maybe less strong against temptation, brothers and sisters. God has given you that strength for service, not for title. Utilize it in the helping, restoring, carrying of each other's burdens together and in that way, we fulfill Christ's law of love. This means that we, in relating to each other, we are very patient in giving each other room to grow. 
We recognize, all of us, as a, having a gracious culture here at Hope, we, we realize everybody still has a, an eternity of growing to do. Okay, no matter where you are in your walk, how well you think you're doing or well you know that you're not doing, we all have an eternity to grow. No one is finished. No one is, is just about to tick their last box of, on the test of Christ-likeness. Every one of us is still growing. And so to experience grace from God means that we also show grace to one another. I see your sin and before I go and beat you with it, I, I remove the plank from my own eye. Before I come and rebuke and get down heavy on you, I, I pray for you. I support you. I encourage you. I offer help and biblical wisdom. This is what a culture of grace will look like in a church, forgiving each other. Let, let me just open up to Colossians chapter 3 because of the, the beautiful way that he says it in that passage. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, 13. Look, he says this, Put on then as God's chosen ones. This is us as a church. Holy and beloved by God. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. That's what we were just talking about. Be, being patient with other people while they still grow. Overlooking some sins against us. Forgiving, encouraging. Next line in verse 13. And if anyone has a complaint against one another. Friends, you will have complaints against other people in this church. I promise it. If you haven't yet, just give it another day or two. You will have complaints and offenses against other people. Always happens. Well, your imperative is to forgive each other. Forgive that person. To what degree? With what motivation? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost, so you also must forgive. Must forgive. This isn't a choice. We forgive our brothers and sisters by, by a reality of law and by loving and bearing with one another, we fulfill that law. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is the the culture of a church that grows. So, so let me just very practically ask, how are you in your life, in your relationship to this church, at the end of this whole church series, maybe you're new to church, maybe you've been here for years or a couple of months, how can you look to grow in these areas of, of, of growing a culture at hope? It, it looks different now. We're not in this room. We're not chatting after the service here. But how can you be in your life Fulfilling love. You know, in, in churches, this is where we, we offer things to people, physical things that people need, cars, rooms at your house, giving them to rent or for free, uh, giving clothes, buying food for, you know, the struggling single mum, you know, giving toys for the kids, looking after each other in babysitting or, or free house sitting, or helping each other move. These are the kind of sacrifices we make for each other. You know, selling things to each other at discounted prices to, to help them out offering the traineeships, all these sorts of things to help out the weaker, the younger among us and the younger helping the, the older and the more mature, serving back because we love each other. How can we be moving more towards that? Not, not in order to create a feeling or an atmosphere, but to rightly fulfill the law of Christ for the church. How can you in your life be, be bringing yourself into more of a, of a shape in your life that looks like Jesus' life, that leaves your comfort, enters into the pain of others, serves other people, preaches the gospel in their context, in their world, using their language, their understanding of things. How can you show more grace? Has God's maturity or God's theological teaching come to you and pumped you up, puffed you up, means that, that you think your maturity is an excuse to take a step back from other people 
and enjoy some of that. Well, that is the opposite of maturity. Rather, God has given you maturity if He has, and wisdom if He has, and and doctrinal, biblical knowledge and experience in life if He has. He's given those to you. How can you pick somebody at church, look out for people who, who are in need at church, and offer the encouragement, offer the accountability, Offer the the prayer. See if you might even have some kind of regular relationship of discipleship or help or teaching or study. How can you be doing that towards each other? And friends, who is there that you need to forgive at church? Who is there at church that you need to maybe apologize to? Uh, Maybe let them know that you haven't treated them in the law of Christ in love. Uh, Maybe right now you just have people in your mind and you need to put their sins against you into the category of paid for at the cross. God forgot it. I can forget it. This is the the culture that we should grow, develop, and enjoy as a church. And and with that, I want to pray over us and tonight and your lives, but also over this whole series of the church and as we continue to grow to fulfill it all the more. Father God, we thank you for the church. What a, what a divinely inspired idea the church is. That the more we study it, the more we break it down, the more our minds explode. The more we see this human gathering of people, we realize from your scripture, it is in fact a divinely communed, divinely ordained meeting. People building, spiritual nation in a sense. God, we thank you for your design. We thank you for what you are doing in the world through your church. And we thank you what you are doing in this church. Thank you for the souls being saved. Thank you for the people who are coming and being blessed. Thank you for those who are becoming more confident and sharing the gospel. Thank you for those who are putting their hand to the plow and getting work done in the church. Well, thank you for those who are, who are giving and may you bless the giving for your glory and mission. We thank you, God, for those who are uh, coming more and more under the authority of the word and repenting of sin. We praise you, God, for you are the source of all of these good things in the church. And we know that you are doing them to build this church and other churches so that into the future, you might give all the glory to Jesus Christ, who is our King, our Savior, our Redeemer, the leader and the head of this church. Father God, I thank you for tonight and pray that you might bless it to the hearers. Would you please save souls through the gospel preached? Would you build your church through the word being taught? And God, as we continue on our preaching into the future, our church life into the future, make us gracious. Make us missionaries to our world. Make us love as you have loved us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and for his glory. And everybody said, Amen. Well, thank you, Tom. That was, that was such a great word. I have so enjoyed this series on the church, and uh, I'm kind of sad that it has to end. But as I said, I'm so excited that uh, next week in Gaming Services we'll be starting a series on First Thessalonians. And, and I kind of feel like saying, you know, that's, that's my favourite book of the Bible, but I, I seem to say that just about, 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 about after every book. <laughs> Maybe it's just the last one I read is my favourite. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And I've so enjoyed the the series that we've just uh, had. Thank you again, Tom. Um, Our doxology today comes from the book of Ephesians. uh, Right at the end of the book of Ephesians. And uh, I'll I'll leave you all with this. Peace to the brethren. In other words, to all of you who love the Lord Jesus. And love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So, God bless you. We leave you with that blessing. Trust that uh, you will have a wonderful week under the circumstances. Uh, We know that whatever happens, our Lord is in control of it all, and we just look to Him. Uh, God bless every one of you, and we trust that we'll catch up with you possibly sometime during the week with our Bible study and virtual fellowship groups, uh, or if not, uh, next week for our morning and evening services online again. God bless you.